coming down to the, what's due tomorrow. Nothing's due tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> Thursday, though, um, you have something to do. We, what about the read-off class? Yeah, I'll talk about the read-off class. <laughs> the KCLO 3 report is due on Thursday, experiment 5. So this report, you just do the calculations and then you fill in the blanks on the report sheet in the lab manual. That's what you'll be turning in. Do we need to the date for the update yet? <laughs> <laughs> a little too soon. Yeah, we have this. You have a test next week. Two tests next week. And then, uh, why don't you post it on Piazza and then we'll get a discussion going and see. You know, if there's enough people that want to do it. But not everybody wants to do it on Piazza. Well, uh, so when when do you want to do? The November 30th. <laughs> When is November 30th? Yeah, what, is, what day is that? <laughs> That's right after coming back from Thanksgiving? Yeah. So you'll have Thanksgiving. Yeah. Alright, we can we could switch in. November 30th. That's fine. Saturday Lab, November 30th. A lot of people don't want it after a big holiday because they don't want to think about it, and so I'm sure I'm going to get complaints from people. Uh, they can turn it in sooner than. Yeah, that's true. They can, you can always turn it in early. You're right. Extra points if they No. Unnecessarily. So. <laughs> Not Friday. We don't have anything to use Friday. Um, all right, so the sulfate lab is due November 30th. Are you sure? Because uh, I'm not going to change it again, I think. This is it. December 2nd. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday or December right. 1st is Monday. December 1st. Okay, how about December 1st? But December 2nd, because December 2nd is a lab day. Oh, yeah, you're right. I don't collect things on lecture days. December 2nd. <laughs> uh, what, when is our exam? When is our exam in December? Uh, December 4th. December 4th. So you're okay with having this due uh, <laughs> the Tuesday before the exam? Yes. Yes? Yeah. All right. Then I'll leave it. So that means we can start early. Yeah. Uh, speaking about starting early, do you guys already have your sulfate percentages calculated? No. no. Yeah, that's why it seemed impossible to. It's such an easy calculation. Why don't you do the calculation? Yeah. Uh, soon. <laughs> yeah. Just the percentage. That's it. Well, that's the start. You know, once you do the calculations, then you can start thinking. All right, maybe I'm not going to post this on Piazza just yet. No. Why not? Because somebody's going to ask me to change it. Somebody's going to say it's a Tuesday right before the exam. It's too much. So, the one right after the exam. 
What's a Tuesday right after the exam? Do we have anything due? I think school ends, right? Yeah, the final. I don't know we have. December 9th. What is December 9th? That week. That's a Tuesday. That's a Tuesday. What do we have on Thursday? Schedule. Our final. Our final exam. Oh, that's not the work. Two weeks before. Why not? November. So this is. <laughs> November 25th. My shoes are too fit. That's the week before the test. Two weeks before the final. November 25th. Yeah, that's a Tuesday. That's a Tuesday. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to have it November 27th, is Thursday? Yes, there's no class. Oh, that's right, Thanksgiving. Yeah. You wanted the Thanksgiving holiday to write it, huh? Yes. Or maybe we'll just leave it at December 2nd. Yeah. As long as it's not this month, I'm good. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I agree, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we have the sulfate lab, and then on <laughs> for experiment 18, I'll probably collect that, not this week, but next week. Yeah, this will be due next week. What about the redox? This is redox, experiment 18. Redox. The, the, the thing about this lab is I want to show you the... Um, Actually, I'll talk about experiment 18 tomorrow in lab. Show you how to set it up, and figure it out. Uh -huh. Which number is the um, test? Let's experiment five. Uh, so when you say the closed, you mean next week on Thursday? That's the twenty-third. Yeah, something like that. Next week. Next week on Thursday. So for experiment five, what exactly do we need to try? For experiment what five? Yeah. The, at the end of the lab is the report sheet. You just fill in the blanks. You know, experiment five. The there's just a small page? No, there's like three pages. Four pages. 11, uh, 511, 512, 513, and 514? Yes. So four pages? Yeah, four pages. Some of the calculations do take some time, like the triple interpolation takes some time. You know, figuring out those. Some of the other calculations are pretty straightforward. Make sure you figure that out. Uh -huh. I have one more question. Okay. Me too. Okay. Sure. Okay. For a uh, question, uh, the first few questions of chapter six, where you have to uh, consider the nanometer and, and use the uh, Pressure the gas equals the pressure barometer plus the change in heat. I'm having a hard time now with the units. Okay. After doing the calculation, I can hear the weird units that don't really enable me to add P bar to the change in heat. All right, look, I need to see the problem. Um, let me bring it up. Thank you. 
the audience is ready. So this is the manometer question. They give you a picture of the manometer. Something's wrong with it in that one. Especially slow. Well, it's almost stopped, so. It doesn't normally take this long. So number five, what is the pressure in millimeters of mercury of the gas inside the apparatus below if the barometric pressure is 740 millimeters of mercury? And so on this side, we have 740 millimeters of mercury. And H1 is 30 millimeters. H1 is 30 millimeters. And H2 is 50 millimeters. So is the uh, gas at a higher pressure or a lower pressure? Lower. Lower. lower pressure. The way I visualize these manometers is just it's a seesaw, you know, with the bar that's supported in the middle. So this side is heavier, much heavier. In order to make the two sides equal in weight, what I gotta do is I gotta make it horizontal. I wouldn't want to make it horizontal here. We got all this air here. I would want to make it horizontal here. And so now I know that the barometric pressure is equal to what? Gas pressure. Gas pressure plus? Atmospheric. It's the, gas, the weight of the gas plus the weight of mercury. the mercury, H1. So this is gas pressure plus H1. And so um, what is the pressure of the gas inside? Well, the pressure of the gas Barometric pressure is equal to the pressure of the gas plus H1. And therefore, the pressure of the gas is equal to the barometric pressure minus H1. So the barometric pressure is 740 the millimeters of Hg liquid. And then H1 is 30. And what is liquid? Is it mercury? Liquid is mercury. If this liquid were water, then we'd have trouble with the units. We'd have to match the units. But since the liquid is mercury, it's 30 millimeters of Hg liquid. So we're both, both the same. And so, you know, it just come out to 710 millimeters of Hg. That would be it. It's just because, you know, barometric pressure, you use a barometer, and the barometer is just going to measure the same thing. It's going to equal the mass of the atmosphere with the mass of a, a liquid column. And the liquid could be any liquid, but the one that's m most often used is mercury because it's so dense. H2, H2 tells us nothing, really nothing. H2 is totally irrelevant. Sometimes they do that. They throw out relevant information to make sure that you know. You know, some people just take a guess because they're given all these numbers, so they try to put them together. You know, multiplying them, dividing them, adding them, subtracting them uh, to get something to work out. But lots of tests, they throw on three or four extra variables to see what you do. You know, you're going to try to use everything, or you're just going to be selective and use just the stuff that you need. 
this is one of those problems where they throw this out just to, to see what you do. Does it throw you off or not? Even though it's kind of low to start doing that, number five, you'd expect it later on. You know? the, the, the early ones, they try to keep more simple. Okay, uh, th does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah I'm going to number, I remember, uh, I think it's two. Number two? Where okay. you have to do, I think you have to do the Calculate the height of a mercury column required to produce a pressure of 0.984 atmosphere. Yeah, well it's kind of like a formula you have to, except you don't have an H, so you have to do the Okay, for number 2A, um, or 2B, or 2C? 2C, I think I got. Okay. 2A and 2B, the the units are going to come out weird, and that's because there are two ways to express pressure. Um, you can express pressure in its real units, which would be a force per unit area. Or you could ex express pressure as in depth, you know, how deep under a mercury pool are you? you know, or how deep? Like uh, some people might say, like if you're nine feet deep, you know, if you're nine feet deep, you're one point something atmospheres of pressure. Or you could just say I'm nine feet deep in water. You, know, you go 20 feet deep. 20 feet deep in water is going to be higher pressure. And so, for this particular problem, they just say, okay, if we can just relate, you know, for swimming pool, if you're 10 feet deep, how many atmospheres is that? 10 feet deep. How many atmospheres? In water. And so you have 10 feet of water, you figure out this is equal to this many atmospheres, right? And then you have some kind of conversion factor that you can use. Well, this is the same thing in, in problem number two is you just memorize it. If you're 760 millimeters deep in a pool of liquid mercury, not that you could sink, you know, you wouldn't be able to sink in this, it's so dense, you know. <coughs> but if you could sink in a pool of mercury, and uh, everything would float, basically. But uh, if you could sink in this, I think even lead, a lead brick would float on the surface of liquid mercury. It's that dense. Or close to being that. Well, if you could sink in a pool of liquid mercury at 760 millimeters uh, deep, then um, we know that's equivalent to one atmosphere. And so this is by definition. And so this is what the relationship we use between, you know, a height or depth and just a regular pressure unit. And so here, um, we would just use dimensional analysis, 0.984 atmospheres. And then we, we have this one memorized, and you should just memorize it, that it, there are 760 millimeters of mercury height for every one atmosphere by definition. By definition, this is exact. And so here, um, atmospheres cancels atmospheres and leaves us with millimeters of mercury. What we end up with. The height of the mercury column is how many millimeters of mercury? So, I think because there's like a hole in the corner of the book for the nanometer, or it's like, where it's, um, like you have it here, uh, there's like the pressure of the gas, which is PR plus the chip, delta P. Um, yeah, th that's for the manometer. Mm -hmm. The book has a weird formula for the manometer. Pressure of the gas is equal to T bar plus delta P. Delta P is negative if the mercury is on the left side, I don't know. They have a weird way of defining it. Delta P is negative or positive depending on what side 
the mercury column is on. Did you guys see this? But you don't have to use this formula. <coughs> you know, delta P is negative if um, the P of the gas is greater than P bar. Delta P is positive if P of the gas is less than P bar. Do you guys remember this in, if you read it in the book? I ignored this completely. And I just said, well, you use the seesaw effect. You know, if you do this and you just draw a line at the lower level, then it doesn't matter. It's always positive. Does that make sense? But this equation here has nothing to do with, with this because this equation we only use for a manometer. You know, when we have a when we have to have a picture of the manometer. You know, because you need to know how high this is. You know, if you're going to use the Brooks formula, is delta P positive or negative? Delta P would be negative, right? If you were to use the Brooks formula. If you were to use the Brooks formula, is delta P positive or negative? But I thought treated my height as the early unknown since I didn't have the picture. Well, um, number two, uh, we, we could talk about this more after class as well, but number two has nothing to do with the manometer because you don't need a manometer to measure this. You know, okay, let's say the pressure is 0.984 atmospheres, right? That's the pressure. <coughs> What we do, what we did in the lab is we just made sure that the liquid levels were equal. And so we have this thing where uh, we have this beaker, a little tube of water coming in here. And then um, this whole thing's filled with water and then we have a gas sample trapped over here somewhere. Gas sample. So we got this gas sample trapped in there. We got water in here. Oops, there's one more thing here, sorry. It's this flask. Something like this. Is the pressure of the gas greater than or less than atmospheric pressure? Greater than. If we wanted to figure out the pressure of the gas, then uh, we would take atmospheric gas pressure and then add the height of the water. You know, we, we convert the height of the water into millimeters of mercury, right? And add the two. But we didn't do that. All we did was we just raise this one until, or lower this one until they're equal. So I just lower, let me lower the beaker down. And then I'll get the two water levels that, they, that they're equal, which tells me that the pressure of the barometer is equal to the pressure of the yes. gas. That's all we did. And by lowering this one, it siphons water back, releasing the pressure on the gas, making it lower pressure. You see, there's no height involved here at all. What's the height? The height is zero. The pressure of the gas is equal to the barometric pressure. See, we don't have to we don't have to have a height at all. And so this problem, you, you don't have any height of a difference here. You know, this this problem it could be it could have been measured using a barometer. You know, in the barometer, this is just the the height that we're measuring is the actual pressure that we're measuring. Okay. Well, we could talk about it more after class. But this would just be a, a just a unit conversion. And that, would, that would be. It. And so the manometer problems. And this goes for the test too. The manometer problems. You'll have the figure in there. If you look at the old exam, did you see the old exam? I put the figure of the manometer in there, and then you had to calculate it. You take a look at the old test. That's the type of problem you'll have to deal with the height. 
All right, there are other questions, right? What other questions do you guys have? No. We're actually not done with chapter six. I'm saving the last part for later. You know, I, I want you guys to work through the homework problems, and then I'm going to talk about real gases versus ideal gases. But for right now, we're going to continue with chapter seven. Did we finish that problem we were working on? The silver one? The silver one? We finished that one? Yeah. Okay. The silver, what did we call the system? Did we, did we talk about system and surroundings? Yes. Yeah. Okay, what do we call the system? The, sil the chunk of silver metal, the surroundings was the water. What about the beaker and the rest of the universe? We ignored it, right? We had a very simplified surrounding. All right, now let's look at system and surroundings in more detail here. There are going to be three types of systems that we're going to deal with. An open system, a closed system, and an isolated system. Actually, open systems we really don't worry about. An open system, even though it looks like a lot of chemistry can happen as an open system, in our calculations we aren't going to treat anything as an open system. In an open system, the system can lose energy or gain energy, but it can also lose matter. So you can see some steam coming off here. What we're going to have uh, mostly is this, a closed system. In a closed system, the only thing that can be exchanged with the surroundings is energy. Matter is trapped in here. So that would be a closed system. Sometimes we deal with an isolated system. In an isolated system, nothing can be exchanged with the surroundings. Matter can't escape, and energy can't escape or enter. Uh-huh. Like for the closed system, do you have to use something to like uh, um, in a closed system, energy can freely come out or can freely go in. There's, there's Except for matter? Just matter can't escape. All right, so mostly we deal with a closed system here. Now, there are two types of closed system that we have. This one is called a fixed volume or constant volume closed system. And so mainly we're dealing with closed systems or once in a while we deal with isolated systems. But in a closed system there are two styles. There's constant volume or constant V. This would be an example of a constant volume. The volume is fixed. It's rigid, right? The other example would be a constant pressure closed system. So using drawings for this, a constant pressure closed system would just have a movable lid. And so rather than having a fixed rigid lid like that, um, we might have a container like this with a lid like this so that if pressure builds up in here, the lid can move up to release the pressure so that the pressure inside here is equal to the pressure outside here. Or if gases are consumed, let's say a vacuum takes place in here. If there's a vacuum, then the lid can squeeze down to equalize the pressure inside and out. And so this would be a constant pressure where the lid 
is, is movable, and therefore the volume can change. The volume can expand and contract depending on what it needs to be done. All right, once, like I said, once in a while we'll deal with isolated systems. So um, an isolated system, nothing can be exchanged. How do you create that? In a vacuum? An isolated system? Uh, this is just ideal. You know, uh, if you have a thermos here, eventually heat's going to escape. It's not much matter will escape, but heat will escape because it's not perfectly insulated. And so the way you would do that is, yes, you would put it in a vacuum because in a vacuum, is there any heat conduction in a vacuum? No, because what, what transfers the kinetic energy? You know, the collisions with the molecules. And so if you had a perfect vacuum, then no heat could ever escape. The problem is, do we have a perfect vacuum? Even when you go and buy those expensive vacuum thermoses, is there a perfect vacuum in those? No. But they're pretty good. You know, they get a decent vacuum, but those are still crude vacuums. You know, I have, um, we, over, uh, over, when I was at UCSB, we had some very fancy, what we call, um, doers. You know, have you ever heard of doer? A doer is like a vacuum thermos, except it has a high vacuum in there, or, yeah, a very high vacuum. And so if you put it, if you put your coffee in a doer and seal the lid, it'd stay hot for a very long time, days, you know? Whereas if you put coffee in here, it'd probably stay hot for hours, you know, rather than days. And so there we just have a much, much better vacuum. It used to be that the vacuums that were in here, you know, there was a glass in here and, and they'd pump down on it and get a really high vacuum. And those, those thermoses are quite expensive, but those are built like doers. What happens if you have an exothermic reaction in a vacuum? What happens if it? The heat stays there. If you have an exothermic reaction mm -hmm. in here, then it just gets hot and stays hot. And it'll stay hot and the heat won't dissipate. It just stays hot. That's it. Until yeah, the heat can be hot. The vacuum? Hmm? Not in the vacuum. The vacuum surrounds the system. So in an isolated system, it's like that. Okay, let's say you have your reaction in here. Now in the isolated system, this whole thing is encased in a vacuum. And so if the reaction occurs inside this container within the vacuum, then this, th everything here gets hot, including the container holding it. But since there's no thermal conduction, like can sound, can sound move through a vacuum? Is it a yell? Can it transmit through a vacuum? Mm -hmm. No. 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 The same thing here. <coughs> it would just get hot, but no heat would be dissipated. It just, it just gets hot. Uh, just, we call this a, uh, an adiabatic system. You know, adiabatic system, the, the heat's just going to stay there. That's it. Versus isothermal systems. You know, the closed system like this would be an isothermal system because if the heat builds up here, right, and there's a temperature difference between inside and outside, the heat is going to leak out, i.e. the kinetic energy is going to be transferred. And so this is called isothermal. This, this, Isothermal and adiabatic come in your homework. Those are two problems, three problems or four problems dealing with adiabatic and isothermal systems. And so isolated system is adiabatic. No heat can be transferred between outside and inside. A closed system like this is isothermal. Heat can be transferred between inside and outside, which maintains constant temperature. Just like we have constant pressure here, we're going to have the, the maintaining the, the, pressure, uh, the temperature. I, I mean, eventually it'll be. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, anyway, adiabatic and um, isothermal, don't worry about those until you hit the homework. Um, hopefully those will make sense when you get the, there. But we have um, to talk about systems. So mainly, this is what we ask. We're mostly dealing with closed system, except for a couple of homework problems. 
And in this closed system, we ask ourselves, is a constant volume that is a rigid container, sometimes we call this a bomb, or is it a constant pressure, a container that doesn't have a fixed volume, like a balloon, you know, versus a bomb? Uh, sometimes this would be called coffee cup, which we'll talk about later. Bomb, coffee cup. Okay, the next thing we ask regarding systems is this. Is the system an object or is the system a reaction or a process? It doesn't matter what, we, what the system is, you know. Um, the system can be a chunk of silver or the system can be some reaction that emits energy like this. And so all systems, that, it can be open, closed, whatever, all systems we have to ask ourselves, is the system an object or is the system a reaction or a process that is a phase change or something like that? If the system is an object, then we know that any energy in the form of heat goes into warming and cooling the object. And when we look at that, well, what relates heat and temperature? What relates heat and temperature is Q is equal to the amount of material times C the heat capacity times delta T. And so this is for Q for an object. Okay, it doesn't matter. This could be a constant pressure or constant volume. It's the same. Now, if we have a, a reaction or process, then um, what we have is, is this. To figure out the heat you know, from a reaction slash process, it's different. The amount of heat that we get depends on how much reaction we have. And this, delta H of the reaction or process. You guys remember delta H? Delta H is sometimes called the heat of reaction. OK, this one is valid for constant pressure. If our system is a constant volume system, then uh, the equation is different. We use amount times delta U of the reaction or process. And we'll talk about the difference between delta H and delta U later. But for right now, we'll just remember these. Okay, so let's take a look at some systems. So what would you say this, um, this is? Is this a constant pressure or constant volume? type of setup here. Constant volume or constant pressure? Well, first, let's say, is it a closed, isolated, open? All right, this is tricky, and so sometimes things aren't always perfect. But let's say the system is going to be a hot lead. If we have hot lead, it's a hot object, right? And let's say the surroundings is this um, insulated beaker with water thermometer. There's air here. And so what happens is the hot lead loses heat to the cold water, beaker, air, thermometer, and insulation. And so this will be our surroundings here, which includes the rest of the universe. Now, when we look at the system and the surroundings, you know, um, what does it look like to you? Constant pressure or constant volume? Constant volume. Okay, on this one, you're both right. Constant volume and constant pressure, because here it looks like everything's trapped inside here. And, um, 
Well, it looks like there's a gap here. So any pressure that builds up here can leak out. But any pressure that builds up here is probably due to steam. So if steam leaks out of here, then all of a sudden our system becomes yeah, kind of open. And so this is kind of complicated in the sense, and this is the way we're going to start looking at system and surroundings. We're just going to be looking at it in the sense that even though this looks like open, uh, we'll just call it closed system. And uh, maybe we could even call it isolated because this doesn't come out, but it depends on how we define the system because there are multiple ways of defining the system. And uh, one of the tricky parts to this chapter is, is figuring out the best way to define the system and the surroundings. And the best way to figure that out is just to do a lot of examples. And so we'll take a look at some examples here. Let's find it. Does the insulation stop uh, energy from moving in and out? The, the insulation should stop energy from moving out, in and out. But do you see that there's a gap there? So matter can move in and out. And if matter can move in and out, um, then energy can leak out of there too. So. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at examples and then see, because it turns out there aren't that many choices that we're going to make. All right, so this is a, if you look inside this reactor here, is this a constant volume or a constant pressure reactor? This is a constant volume. Do you see a lid that can move up and down? No. And so this is a, what we'll call a bomb. A bomb, it should be able to withstand very high pressures or very high vacuums. So it won't explode or implode. And so usually this is heavy steel and uh, designed to withstand large changes in pressure while maintaining constant volume. That's our bomb. However, uh, this re reactor here is not designed to withstand high pressures, is it? and high vacuum, a couple of styrofoam cups, no. And so this would be constant pressure. You know, pressure builds up, it'll leak out. If it leaks out, then what happens? Well, what happens, well, it depends on how we define the system. So let's put this to practice. Um, the way we're going to put this to practice, actually, I forgot to show you that video. Um, yeah, it would be constant. This would be constant pressure. So, so yeah. If pressure leaks out, then the pressure wouldn't be constant? Yeah, the, it's yeah. okay, let's talk about that um, with some examples, and then you'll see. What we do, um, is uh, we have different ways of looking at things. And so we'll start with a couple of examples that we're going to do tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we're starting experiment two, but we aren't um, using CBL. We're going to use a new system that we just got. And so I need to modify. Uh, don't write any of the instructions for the TI-83 CBL. So the new thing we have is called LabQuest 2. And so for the CBL, you, you get the TI-83, you run this program called ChemBio, and then you plug in all the parameters. And we have step-by-step -step instructions. Push this button, push that button, enter 15, do that. Well, the new LabQuest is, is much easier. Rather than inputting the parameters in the CBL and the calculator, it has a graphical interface. And so it's so simple. For example, it asks you uh, how many minutes of experiment do we have? 
uh, what is the frequency of data acquisition. And so um, when you guys prep, you're going to just prep for the water for Tuesday and then the rest of the experiment for Thursday. And so on Tuesday, um, we're going to talk about the data acquisition using LabQuest 2. And so, omit all the TI-83 instructions in your prep. And the instructions for LabQuest 2 are very simple. We'll add those in as we do it. So what are we doing um, on Tuesday? What we're going to do is we're going to heat up some hot water. We're going to put it into styrofoam cups. So we have 50.0 milliliters of hot water. We're going to put two cups to get more insulation, and then we're going to put a lid and a thermometer here. Now, is this a fixed volume apparatus? So for example, if the pressure built up in here, would the lid move, or is the lid rigid? The lid is rigid. If the lid is rigid, does that mean it's constant volume? Is, is this a constant volume container? No. The reason that it's, the answer is no is because um, what happens is there are gaps. This lid doesn't provide an airtight seal. Let's compare it to this one at the beginning of the chapter. Yeah, we'll talk about we'll talk about that because um, sometimes it doesn't fit exactly this, but it's close, and so we'll just call it this. This would be rigid. This would be fixed volume. Do you see? If we built up pressure here, can it escape? Can it leak out? No. Whereas over here, if we built up pressure, it can leak out around the cap, and this thermometer isn't an airtight seal, and so hot air can escape there. When it escapes, what happens? Well. What's the room pressure here? The room pressure is about one atmosphere, right? Just having a little bit of gas escape here, is that going to change the pressure in the room? No, the pressure in the room is about one atmosphere. And so this is like, if you have a big swimming pool and you add a few drops of water, did it really change the volume of water much? No, and so it's fairly constant volume. Do you see that? It would be constant volume. Well, this is constant pressure because the pressure inside here is the same as the pressure outside here. That's what we call constant pressure. Well, now we have our 50 milliliters of hot water. And then at the same time, um, well, what we want to do is we want to monitor the temperature of this. So when we pour hot water in here, is this an isolated system? That is, if I pour water in here, is this a perfect vacuum thermos and no heat's going to leak out? No, what's going to happen is the hot water is going to cool down. And so what we need to know is we need to know the temperature of the water at any time during this experiment. And so how can we know the temperature of the water when it's cooling all the time? And so what we're going to do is we're just going to monitor the temperature of the hot water. Uh, with time. And so the hot water is going to start off like this, right here. But we aren't going to keep an eye on it. That is, we don't have to measure it continuously to see how the temperature is changing at every moment. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to monitor it at one minute intervals. And that should give us enough data to figure out what's happening. And so if I measure the temperature initial here, it's pretty hot. Let's say 80 degrees C. 
And then one minute later, what do you think is going to happen to the temperature? It's going to drop. Okay. Now, is cooling a, a linear phenomena or non-linear phenomena? Because if it's a linear phenomenon, then all we really need are two data points to define a line, right? And so do you think it's going to be a straight line cooling or curve cooling? It turns out it's, it's non-linear, you know, because the hotter it is, the faster it cools. And as it gets closer to room temperature, the cooling rate slows down. And so it depends on the delta T. The bigger the delta T, the faster the cooling rate. And so it's fairly non-linear. So what we want to do is we want to collect enough data to see what the curve looks like. And this way, we wouldn't do a, what's called linear interpolation. A linear interpolation assumes that it's linear between the two data points. What's going to work out better for us is to do a curve fitting. And so we're going to assume it's not linear. And then if we want to figure out what the temperature is at various times, we could do that by doing a curve. So we see what the curve looks like. The curve is going to look something like this. You know, at one minute intervals, we wouldn't want to do a linear interpolation, but at tight intervals, let's say we collected data at very tight intervals, then the data points are so close together that we might be okay with a linear interpolation. So let's say we wanted to know the temperature right at this point in time, we could figure it out, right, by doing a linear interpolation just like we did in experiment five. But since the gaps here in the data are kind of wide and it is fairly curved, right? Let's say you only took two data points, one at zero and one at four minutes. Would you do a linear interpolation between these two data points? Would that be accurate? Let's say I wanted the temperature here. Well, you'd estimate it as up here if you did a linear interpolation between these two. Does that make sense? And so we are doing linear interpolation here. What we're going to do here is we're going to do a mathematical curve fit like this. And see, now we can predict the temperature based on the simple mathematical fit or the simple eyeball fit. And so even though we didn't measure the temperature, if we wanted the temperature, let's say, at this time, we could figure it out, right, by going to the curve. And doing that. Okay, why do we want to figure out the temperature? Well, the, the reason we want to figure out the temperature is this is what we're going to do. We're going to take 50 milliliters of cold water, cold being room temperature water, in the same kind of setup, double insulated styrofoam cups, lid. There's going to be a temperature probe in here. These temperature probes are stainless steel. Yeah, um, inside them, they have a temperature sensitive uh, electronics. And so we'll put in 50.0 milliliters of cold water. And then the same thing here. When we get the water out of the tap, it might not be room temperature. And so what we want to do is we want to monitor and see are there any temperature changes in the cold water. And so at the same time we're monitoring the hot water, we're monitoring the cold water. Let's say the cold water starts off here at the 22.4 uh, degrees C. Let's say room temperature is like 23 degrees C. Well, then it's going to warm up. Is it going to warm up rapidly? No. no. And so what we'll do is we'll just monitor here as time goes on. That way, um, here, it should be, because the temperature of the water, the cold water, room temperature is so close, it should be fairly linear here. And so this is the cold water. And so what we can do is we can interpolate between points to figure out what the temperature is at any time. That's fine. OK, so we're going to collect data. I think about five minutes worth of data is enough, or six minutes. Let's see, time zero, one, two, three, four. We're going to go five, collect five minutes of data.
All right. Then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, to, well, your instructions say to pour the hot water into the coal. That's what the instructions say. But what happens if I remove the lid on the hot water? Does that change its cooling rate? Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Is it going to speed up the cooling or slow down? It's going to speed up the cooling rate. And so now we just generated this nice cooling curve. If I pop off the lid, it's going to cool more rapidly. Do I want that? No. And so the instructions say to pop the lid off the hot water and then pour it through room temperature air and then mix it with the cold water. As you're pouring it out of the cup and it hits the cold air, what's going to happen? The same thing, you're going to introduce even more air. And so I want you to change the procedure. I want you to change it. Pour the cold into the hot. So here, if we pop the lid off the cold water, am I going to expect any dramatic temperature changes? No. no. Okay, so I pop the lid off the cold water, and as I get close to minute six, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop the lid off the hot, dump in the cold, and then replace the lid on the hot as quickly as possible. And so what that means is now at minute six, what I have is I'm measuring the air temperature. on the cold temperature probe. So this is air. And then at minute six, you know, I pop the lid off, and so this temperature is going to drop probably significantly because now it's just in the air, right? But it's dissipating heat slowly. And then I pop the lid back on and start mixing it. As I start mixing it, I may hit a hot spot, I may hit a cold spot, hot spot. But eventually, as I mix this, it will thoroughly mix. Once it's thoroughly mixed, then I should see a nice, smooth cooling curve. And so these initial points aren't good because we have incomplete mixing. And since we have incomplete mixing, we just ignore these points here. It's just when we have complete mixing, actually even this point looks incomplete here. It's just when we have these points, now it looks pretty good. It looks like everything was well mixed. The next modification is, sometimes it takes time to mix these. And so they're asking for 13 minutes worth of total data. I don't want 13 minutes, I want 15 minutes, an extra two minutes worth of data. In other words, an extra two data points. Because in the past, people have gotten this, uh, really sluggish mixing, and they didn't have enough points to define the cooling curve of the mixture. Now, once we have the cooling curve of the mixture, this is what we're going to do. We're going to say, if we left the thermometer, or the, it's not a thermometer, we don't call it, if we left the temperature probe or thermocouple in the hot, what would the temperature have been at six minutes? And so what we're going to do is we're going to do an extrapolation, not an interpolation. The extrapolation is we're going to extrapolate this curve out to six minutes and then read the temperature off the curve. And so this, this temperature we call T hot, the temperature of the hot water at the time of mixing. Okay, then we're going to do the same thing for the cold. We'll extrapolate it to six minutes. The cold water should have given this temperature, not this temperature. And so this will be T cold. And then what we'll do is we'll back extrapolate the mixture. Now the mixture is something like this. This will be T mix. Uh, that's not a great curve. No, it should be a smooth cooling curve. That's what we're going to do. All right, all right, so we're going to collect 15 times 3 is 45 data points. Actually, more. 48 data points. We're collecting 48 data points just to get three temperatures. 
Why do we have to collect so much data just to get three temperatures? Because you know we can't mix in one instant and we can't measure. Can you can you measure the temperatures when you're mixing it and have it mix in, in an instant? No. And so we have to do this so we can back extrapolate and figure out what the correct temperatures were at the time of mixing. Right now, we have to come up with a, a system and a surroundings. And so here, we know from first law thermodynamics, Q of the system is equal to minus Q of the surrounding. And so what do you want to call the system? Water? Should we call it the hot water, the cold water, or both? The 100, 100 milliliter mixture of water. Because we're going to dump the cold water into the hot, and then we're going to have this mixture that's going to cool down. The warm water? The warm water? Yeah. Would we do that? You could. You could call it the warm water, but that's not going to be the easiest. In fact, your book is going to call it the warm water because they do the procedure uh, reverse of what we do. Um, the easiest for the system will be the cold water. The cold water. I'll tell you why in a minute. This is going to equal minus Q the surroundings. So what will be the surroundings here? It'll be the hot water. And what else? So when I pour the cold water into the hot, the cold water warms up and the hot water cools down. The cold water gains energy, the hot water loses energy, but it's not just the hot water. What else is hot? Is the, is the probe hot? Yes, the probe is hot. So the hot probe will lose heat. Is the air in here hot? The hot air will lose heat to the cold water. How about the styrofoam cups? The styrofoam cups are two, and the air surrounding this, in other words, we're going to have the hot water plus the cups plus the probe plus the air, etc. All right, now, do we want to um, measure how many grams of cups we have or how many moles? Or the probe, do we want to weigh the probe and figure out how many grams and determine that specific heat? Now, we don't want to do any of that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to call all this stuff the calorimeter. It's the name we're going to give it. The calorimeter is the probe, the cups, the air, the lid, and the rest of the universe. It's the calorimeter. And so the calorimeter was in thermal contact with the hot water. And so both the hot water and the calorimeter are going to lose energy, and the cold water will gain the energy. OK, so uh, the cold water is an object. And so the cold water is just the amount of cold water times specific heat of water times delta T of the cold water. And so that's how much energy will be absorbed. The amount of energy lost will be minus, now the hot water is an object, so it's the amount of hot water times C of water times delta T of hot water. And so C of water is a number you should have memorized. OK, the calorimeter, we're just treating that as one object. So how many calorimeters do we have? We have the amount of calorimeters times C of the calorimeter times delta T of the calorimeter.
So in, in this, um, the system is just this water, this cold water here. And um, the surroundings is everything else. So let's take a look. How much cold water do we have? What's the amount? 50.0 milliliters, which is the same as 50.0 grams. So we have 50.0 grams. C is 4.18 joules per gram degree C. Delta T, delta T would be T final minus T initial. T final is the temperature of the mixture at six minutes. Minus T initial is the temperature of the cold water at six minutes. That's delta T. So we have everything here. We can calculate how much heat was absorbed by the cold water by measuring its temperature increase. Now, the amount of heat lost by the hot water is the amount of hot water, 50.0 grams. C is the same, 4.18. And delta T of the hot would be the temperature of the mix at six minutes minus temperature of hot at six minutes. So we have based on the temperature change of the hot water, how much heat was lost by the hot water. Okay, now how much heat was lost by the rest of the universe, the calorimeter and everything else? Well, the amount of calorimeters is, how, how many calorimeters do we have? One. C of the calorimeter, do we know the, the specific heat of the heat capacity of the calorimeter? No. Delta T of the calorimeter, what is that? Well, the calorimeter was originally the same temperature as the hot water. And the calorimeter, being in thermal contact with the hot water, will end up at the same temperature. And that will be T mix. And so delta T hot is the same thing as the delta T of the calorimeter. The hot water and the calorimeter are in thermal equilibrium. And so the on only unknown here is the heat capacity of the calorimeter. So in the first part of the experiment, we solved for the heat capacity of the calorimeter. In other words, how much heat is lost via these um, styrofoam cups? The amount would just be one. And so if this is the amount of one, then it, it just simplifies plus C of the calorimeter times delta T. That's going to change the units. The units, you know, this is per object. And so the units of the calorimeter will be in joules per object, which is one calorimeter times degrees C. Most of, most of, so we only have one object, people leave that out and just say it's joules per degree C because you can only have one calorimeter. You can't have two calorimeters. Right? If you have two calorimeters, then you have to double the heat loss by the calorimeter. Now, this should be fairly small because the styrofoam cups are, are pretty, pretty well insulated. Um, however, what would you expect this one? If we were to look at the heat lost out of this thermos, would it be smaller or bigger than the styrofoam cups? Hmm? A lot smaller. Yeah. And so it's, this setup is not nearly, I mean, if, if this were perfectly insulated, you know, what would the heat loss be? Nothing. We'd lo we wouldn't lose any heat, right? So it'd be zero as the heat capacity. All right, the problem is, and this is why I changed the experiment. The reason I changed the experiment is not to give you um, grief, but the reason I changed the experiment, pouring the cold into the hot, is because doing it the other way, a lot of people get enough error to get a negative heat capacity for the calorimeter. What would the negative heat capacity of the calorimeter tell you? What it would tell you is that if you poured a hot cup of coffee in your styrofoam cups, rather than cooling down, it would, it would heat up. And so if you got, let's say, a negative 100 joules per degree C, then it's impossible. Because how can the coffee get hotter in a cold room? 
And so it used to be about 10% of the students um, would get that when we poured the hot into the cold because of too much air. They're too slow. But um, this way, a lot fewer, only one or zero per semester, but negative. All right, so did we really have to define closed system or open system or isolated system? For that particular problem? No. All right, on Thursday, uh, the next example we're going to do is we're going to take fifty point zero milliliters of what we call room temp water or cold water. And um, in this problem, we're going to add some solid sodium hydroxide to it. And this is going to be pre-weighed. One point nine eight grams. And then we're going to dump the sodium hydroxide into the cold water while monitoring the, the temperature. Alright, the sodium hydroxide is not what we call a primary standard. Um, do you guys recall what primary standards are? Like oxalic acid dihydrate? Types of things. The primary standard is. I talked about sodium hydroxide before. Sodium hydroxide is extremely hydroscopic. It's so hydroscopic it deliquesces, which means weighing it is very difficult. If you try to weigh the stuff, what happens? Get it gets heavier. And so what's going to happen is Anne's going to have this. It's going to be in the desiccator, and you're going to come up and get it right before you need it. If you get it, before, well before, and it sits on your desk, what's going to happen is it's going to pluck water molecules out of the air, and pretty soon there's going to be a puddle of liquid sodium hydroxide AQ there. And so get this. It's going to be very sticky, so it's going to be hard to dump in here. And so you're going to do your best to dump it in. And so the same type of thing here. We're going to monitor the cold water temperature. In this case, we're only monitoring one temperature, the temperature of the cold water. We're going to assume that the temperature of the sodium hydroxide is the same as room temperature, which is going to be the same as this, the cold water. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, minute 6, what are you going to do? Right before minute 6, you're going to pop the lid and dump in the sodium hydroxide. What's going to happen with the sodium hydroxide is this. The sodium hydroxide is very soluble in water. And so sodium hydroxide and water mix to form sodium hydroxide AQ. This is called dissolution. It's dissolving solid. And this dissolution process is exothermic. That is, delta H is less than zero. And so we're going to get P. And so now let's figure out what we're going to call the system and what we're going to call the surroundings. What would the system be here? The cold water? That's fine. But, you know, it would be easier if you called the system Hmm? It would be easier to be called the system the sodium hydroxide. Why? Because the cold water is in contact with what we call the calorimeter in the rest of the universe. And so we want to treat the cold water and the calorimeter as being the surroundings, since it takes into account the rest of the universe. So Q of the sodium hydroxide is equal to minus, now what are the surroundings in this case? What do you say? Well, the cold water and the calorimeter. The calorimeter takes into account the styrofoam cups, the lid, the air, the thermometer, everything, right? And so it'd be cold water plus the calorimeter. All right, now for our system, 
which is the sodium hydroxide, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is this. We're going to mix, and the temperature is going to heat up. So here, initially, there'll be hot spots and cold spots. But eventually, it'll be completely mixed, where it'll start cooling down in a nice trend. And so what do we do about the, these spots here, these temperatures that are fluctuating? These temperatures are due to incomplete mixing. Since it wasn't completely mixed, what are we going to do with those? We're going to ignore them. We aren't going to average them. We're going to completely ignore them. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if we could have mixed it rapidly or more rapidly, we would have seen it starting to cool down quite nicely from the start, from the get-go. And so if we could have mixed it in one instant of time, it would have shot up to this temperature and then cooled down nicely in this trend. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. This is back. And so what we're going to get is we're going to get the temperature at six minutes. This would be the temperature of the mix. And the same thing here. The cold water, we didn't measure the temperature at six minutes, but we can extrapolate it out. This is the temperature of the cold water. Here. So the temperature pops up. Now, <coughs> what is Q of the sodium hydroxide equal to? How much heat was gained or lost by the sodium hydroxide? So Q of the sodium hydroxide equals what? It equals the what amount? times C times delta T. Amount times C times delta T. So we must be, what are we doing? Are we dumping in hot sodium hydroxide? We're going to dump in hot sodium hydroxide and the sodium hydroxide is going to warm up because of that? Or hmm, are we dumping cold sodium hydroxide into hot water? No. This is not an object. This is a system that is a reaction or a process. In other words, this is what happens. We have sodium hydroxide. What's the temperature of the sodium hydroxide solid that you get from the stock room? Room temperature. What's the water? Liquid room temperature. Where's all that energy coming from? All that energy is coming from this. When we mix it, energy is released upon mixing. But that energy that's released here to form sodium hydroxide, AQ, does this. This system starts off at room temperature. And what we do is we allow the sodium hydroxide to cool back down to room temperature. A room temperature doesn't have to be 25 degrees C in this particular case. Okay, once the sodium hydroxide has completely cooled back down to room temperature, then it's released the maximum amount of heat. And so where does that heat go? Into the surrounding. So Q in the system is not this. What is Q when this is a reaction or process? Q is equal to the amount times... Well, we have to figure out, is this a constant pressure or constant volume? This is constant pressure, so it's going to be the amount times delta H. If this were a constant volume, it would be the amount times delta U, not delta H. And so it's going to be the amount times delta H. And the process is called dissolution. It's not a chemical reaction, it's a physical process. And so the amount is 1.98 grams of sodium hydroxide, delta H in dissolution. It can be in um, grams or kilojoules. Now, where is all that heat going to? Into the surroundings. So what is the surroundings now? 
And so the surroundings are going to warm up here because the, you know, the heat is being input. And so cue the surroundings. Cue the surroundings will be opposite sign. Cue the system is going down. Cue the surroundings is going up. To make them equal, I change the sign. So it flips this arrow down. But nonetheless, this, all this heat is going into the surroundings. What is the surroundings? Well, the surroundings, is it the 50.0 milliliters of cold water? Is that the surroundings? Hmm? And the calorimeter? Uh, actually not. This is wrong. The surroundings will be everything left over. Okay, once the sodium hydroxide has dis dissolved, the system has disappeared. Okay, this system has a finite life. And so the sodium hydroxide dissolves, releases all the energy. What we're left over with is the surroundings. What are we left over with? We're not left over with water. We're left over with aqueous sodium hydroxide at room temperature. And when that aqueous sodium hydroxide, well, and calorimeter. Aqueous sodium hydroxide and calorimeter at room temperature. And when this aqueous sodium hydroxide and calorimeter at room temperature absorb all that energy from the dissolution process, what's going to happen? It's going to get hot. It's going to get hot because these are objects. The only thing that objects do are cool down and heat up. And so now we're going to have sodium hydroxide aqueous plus calorimeter at T mix, right? This is, our T is T cold. T cold, T cold, and now we're going to have T mix. This is all six minutes, right? And so Q of the surroundings is equal to Q of the sodium hydroxide, AQ, plus Q of the calorimeter. That takes care of everything. Well, Q of the sodium hydroxide, AQ, is equal to the amount times C times delta T. The amount of sodium hydroxide AQ, we, we know, it's going to be 51.98 grams of sodium hydroxide AQ. The 50 grams of water plus the 1.98 grams of sodium hydroxide. Your, your mass will be different. depends on how much N weighs out. C, well, what is the specific heat? I don't know. Delta T, we know. You know, it's a T mix is the final temperature. T cold was the initial temperature. OK, C, the calorimeter, what is that equal to? How many calorimeters do we have? One. So I don't need to write one times C of the calorimeter times delta T. And so Q of the calorimeter is just equal to C of the calorimeter times delta T. The amount times C times delta T, right? C of the calorimeter we know, delta T we know, because the calorimeter is the same temperature as the cold solution, and the same temperature as the hot solution. So it's going to be the same, delta T. These two delta T's are the same. All right, so now we have two unknowns. Delta H of dissolution is unknown, and C of the sodium hydroxide, the specific heat of sodium hydroxide is unknown. Both of these we can look up in a book, but you know sometimes you don't have a book available. And so one thing is, if we have two unknowns like this, actually I'm out of time, but let me just finish by saying this. If we have two unknowns like this, one thing we could do is we could just stop here and say not enough information. But when you progress in advanced classes, they don't want you to stop here. They want you to solve the problem, even though you're going to introduce more error into it. And so what we can do is we can estimate delta H. Is that easy to estimate? No. Or we can estimate C of sodium hydroxide. Would that be easier to estimate? Sodium hydroxide AQ is 50 grams of water, 1.98 grams of sodium hydroxide. It's mostly water. So if it's mostly water, we can guesstimate C of sodium hydroxide will be close to C of water. And so in order to solve this problem, even though it introduces an error, we're going to assume that the specific heat of the aqueous sodium hydroxide is close to the specific heat of water 
Otherwise, we can't solve it. And we're stuck. There's two unknowns, right? And so that's something you'll have to do with often in, in other classes, but uh, we're going to just start doing it now. All right, uh, we'll stop here and then.